I'm here with Grandmaster Pravin Thipse, who played kind of a model game in the exchange variation of the Rai Lopez from the black side. Uh, Pravinji, you you were with the black pieces against Kiran Monisha Mohanty. Can you take us through the game? Yeah, it was uh, quite a, a different type of game. Uh, she has played a lot of openings, so I didn't know uh, what to prepare. But certainly, this is the least I was prepared for. And uh, as a result, I thought uh, I should try something uh, which I haven't really tried. When someone plays the exchange Rai Lopez against you, do you feel kind of pleased or do you feel like, oh no, not, not this? No, I am a little upset because uh, the winning chances are considerably reduced for both sides, I think. <laughs> Uh, but still, yes, it has its flexibility and uh, it le leads uh, to more or less on very accurate skills. So, uh, perhaps accuracy can be missing and positionally there is no uh, danger in playing such positions. But uh, very often you miss accuracy and you find, okay, you have to play accurate till the end of the game. So, that's a sort of uh, difficult uh, feeling for both the sides. I have played this position with white as well. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, which find it very difficult to play for the opponent as well. So it's not that Adiban played with me with white and I had an easy draw. I played with Ganguly and it became a draw. So it's not that it's not fighting, but uh, it makes a draw very easy sometimes. And particularly against the most solid variation F6, I think draw is easier. So today it's too early in the tournament to play for equality uh, from the opening. Mm -hmm. So, I thought I could uh, play ending where the pawn structure was more flexible compared to the other one. The other, the pawn structure is more solid. But I had uh, not seen this opening at all. So, I think it was just a original game probably because uh, queen into d4, queen into d4, knight into d4. Uh, here I thought In that general, I should… general, what should be black's… What should be black aiming for here? Uh, according to well, I, I think if you play windy 6 line, the bishop is here. So, in a way, uh, you are a tempo down. But I don't consider bg5 as a tempo. Mm -hmm. I think black should try to uh, castle on the queen side and avoid the exchange of the uh, bishops because then the two knights uh, against uh, bishop and knight can be strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, black must avoid pawn ending because pawn ending white is winning by advancing the king side pawns. Correct. And even rook endings because you have to occupy the only rook file. But as the game gets opened up, I think uh, black has more comfortable position. So I felt I should play differently. So I played bd7 and then for knight c3. I just uh, decided to uh, avoid uh, playing f6. I don't know what was the reason behind that. But I just thought lesser the weaknesses, easier to play. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, I think I just played this. And uh, my idea is to meet bishop f4 with long castle always. Rook e1. So I think here we have a sort of a standard position where uh, nothing is uh, particularly. Uh, so what white should do is not so clear. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I think both sides do not have much of a plan. Uh, in g6, uh, I think was a move which I. Uh, yeah, rook d1, ng6, h6, bishop with long castle, knight d, uh, e2. Yes, white also has uh, difficulty in, so knight d, e2, sorry. White also has difficulty because uh, white has no specific plan. And uh, here uh, she didn't know whether to put uh, knight on d4 or bishop on d4. Mm -hmm. Because the advantage of the position other than uh, normally the pawn is on f6. So, I don't have a good square for the bishop. So, I just deliberately played this structure. I wanted to put bishop on f6. Okay. And see, it's a different kind of game where I could threaten something. Also, sometimes with bishop b4, I could threaten uh, doubling of the pawns. Bishop b4, knight e5, knight c4 can be irritating. So, she decided to make this well protected. And for bishop b7, she played bishop d4, preventing. Yeah, I mean, she could have waited for uh, bishop f6 and then bd4, uh, then bd4. That was an option also. Mm -hmm. So here again, playing f6 and probably h5 is roughly equal. But I thought let me just keep option of uh, uh, just not moving the f4. So now there. maybe you want to play c5 and bishop f6 or uh, something like that. Yeah, the problem in c5 is often eventual knight d5 uh, coming. But yeah. yeah, because if I play c5, bishop b3, bishop c6, then knight d5 can force the image I draw. I don't know if she was playing for a draw. Obviously, she was not playing for a draw from the opening. But uh, I, I was maybe I just thought I could improve 
something some advance on the queen side or maybe just wait for her next move i think at this stage if white plays f3 then i think it's roughly equal position i was thinking of creating some weakness bishop, bishop h4 just provoke g3 and come back bishop g5 and f4 and just come back mm -hmm. i was not eager to play c5 soon till this knight had taken a position so i was just hoping that uh, if white uh, if i force the uh, white to advance uh, the pawns to black squares then at least the bishop can really get some uh, dangerous positions on g4 and h3 and so, a move like f5 is never really good right in such a uh, no f5 F is good but with knight on d4 generally it's not possible to play uh, but here in this, yeah, in this position f5 f5 is good because uh, 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 in direct f f5 also because e f5 bishop into f5 the bishop gets much more as the game gets opened up uh, the minority attack uh, I can carry on against the king also, but mainly I start attack against c2 pawn. Mm -hmm. The major, uh, I think, idea in this is to provoke white to play c3, then my bishop would get a square at d3 and sort of. f5 is a, already a plan here. And uh, for knight g3, I was expecting knight g3 for which I was planning to play knight h4. And then I was trying to play maybe, I don't know, g5, g4, and f5, just try to play to attack those points. And uh, just maintain the knight on h4. Once I had seen Alekhin maintaining a knight on h4, which became very annoying to the opponent's g2 point. And she played f4, after which I think I am better because um, now her white squares are very weak. Mm -hmm. And uh, f5. I think this position probably, I am not sure, black is already better. I had two plans which I executed. One was to play c5 and bishop c The other one was to put the knight yes. on e6 first. I, th I was thinking of this plan. First knight f8, knight, knight e6, e6 and, then try for and, g5. and then g5. And that would have been probably more correct. But I was eager to activate this bishop and I was hoping that knight can go to h4 and g5. <laughs> it was too ambitious, I think. But uh, she just prevented with g3. You know, it's, yeah, if g3 is not played, then knight h4 is a threat. Hmm. But uh, and knight h4 and g5, then probably I was trying to be very greedy. But after g3, I think uh, I find that the rooks are not connected, and knight f8 is not uh, very useful. So here, uh, here I think that uh, c5 was a little hasty. And although I am better, it's not completely uh, winning. But uh, yes, black has better chances. And uh, in, in practical play, I think there is no. Uh, useful moves for white, there are no useful moves. So I just, now, do you think exchanging both the rooks will be fine for black? Because white yeah, has got uh, a protected passer. No? Yeah, but uh, uh, the white square, the bishop, will, bishop is very bad. The e3 bishop is very bad. And I think that the white bishop is, uh, has no parallel. But yes, if I could keep two rooks, then I would have been very happy. But uh, unfortunately, if I play knight f8, then rook into d8 check and rook d1 check and knight d5. Hmm. I can't maintain this bishop. If white gets this structure, then obviously yes. white has a good uh, position. So I thought it was good to play at least b5 to prevent the structure from coming. And as it is, she must exchange uh, both the rooks, which of course I was prepared for because uh, when I played c5, I was prepared for this position. So rook d1. And then my idea is to now transfer the knight to e6 and also penetrate with the bishop wherever we can. And also the weaken the position, the pawns, as the pawns move on the white squares, I am uh, happy because my bishop has more and more space and that's what uh, exactly I was planning. So rook d1 I just took, took and played bishop e4 first. So this move forces one more pawn on um, white square which means I have a permanent square. So I have just one question Sorry. here. Uh, this is better for you and let's say it's clear for you. But uh, it could yeah. be clear for many players as well. But the difficulty lies in how to move ahead. And in such positions, how do you plan actually? Uh, how do you think that black should make progress? Do you do it schematically? Do you do move by move? Uh, very often move by move depending on white strategy. For example, if white keeps the king on king side, then I was plan planning to play, uh, bring the king to d5, put bishop on b1, knight on e6, and then a5 and b4. Mm -hmm. I should play b4 when c4 is not coming. So that would uh, eventually weaken. I was worried about bishop b1, uh, bishop b1, knight c1 structure, because in this structure I didn't know there is no uh, target on a3, and uh, if such structure comes, I was little worried about this position. Without uh, then I was planning to uh, break g5 by putting the knight on e6. I think you have to play uh, uh, different uh, at different times. For example, here you just try to get king to d5 and break g5. 
and I don't know, a completely airtight drawish position is generally not possible. Because <laughs> in such position, I may even get a knight, try to get knight to d3. Mm. So, you know, the various plans will have to be made depending on what defensive plan your opponent is uh, so doing. In, so, in this position, you don't really go for some kind of a master plan, you keep making small. Yes, small uh, there's no specific plan, I think, because obviously you have to penetrate and where your opponent permits, because your opponent also has three minor pieces. So, it's not easy to uh, penetrate because all the almost all the squares are covered. But generally, uh, somewhere the knights get tied down. If the knight comes to the king queen side, the king side could fall apart. And uh, the way she took the king to uh, queen side, there's a chance of my penetrating with the king to, at e4. You always keep an uh, option, and uh, you have to look for a, a mistake, which uh, probably leads to a win. I would say that an engine could probably Four draw years, this yeah. position. Yeah. So one can I would say. Slight advantage, maybe equal plus uh, advantage, but yes, black can keep on playing. Black. Also, black has a difficult uh, uh, question: where to put the bishop? Because to at b1 or at d5, because king. Is, I wanted to. If you want to put king on d5, then obviously uh, bishop cannot be on d5. If you put bishop on c4, the pawn must be on a3, and uh, then the, you have to always worry about the annoying b3. Hmm. Uh, when I played a4 in the game, I think I had. Uh, given up some of my advantage because the pro proper idea is to play b4 and a b then c b and then you have uh, b and c pass pawns. Whereas when I played a4 by capturing twice she could have isolated my pawns a4 and c7. That is also a possibility for her, a defensive possibility. Again when I break b4 and both sides capture twice, immediately white shouldn't get knight c3 otherwise white gets counter play. So it was very difficult to bring about the plan of b4 and targeting a3. And uh, I think it had to be tactically managed in a very difficult terms in the sense you have to keep on playing unforced moves and uh, look for unforced variations where you get a slide. From that point of view, it's a very difficult position to play with 90 minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, that's one of the things I'm always worried about. You play well, you play well sometimes and Time then, you, then, you find, then you find that you're not actually able to win. So, that was... So, again, here I played BB1. I was trying to provoke uh, A3. She played A3, I think. If I was white, I wouldn't have played a3. I would probably play knight c1. But again, what to do with knight on c1 is also a problem. Yeah. But knight c1 and b3 is too committal then. Actually, so, a move like a3, uh, you don't really understand as white as how black could take advantage of that. I mean, it happens slowly, but at this point to make the move a3 and think, okay, it could be a weakness is not so easy. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not uh, it's not impossible to play such a move. No, my ideal position is to put bishop on c4 and break uh, b4. Then the a3 pawn will be weak. When I'm in a bishop is somewhere because the a3 pawn becomes really weak. The problem in this plan is very often. But uh, if he doesn't do anything, then. Yeah, then eventually I have to play ba, ba, c4, or I have to play c. Sometimes I have to play for such structure where the bishop has to go and go and defend. Now, if I can't break. See if I have a knight on a4 coming, this is an option. So, keeping the pawn on a5 is always good. But again, you have to see the counterplay. Yeah. Once I play c5, then the bishop is practically dead. And if I get, say, a knight a4 is such a dream position, this could probably be winning, but we are still not sure of uh, this outcome. Yeah. Maybe knight coming to d3 is always a possibility, but once c3, the idea of provoking is very often I can get into uh, such uh, positions. So, various options are there, but yeah, a3 is a Committal mode. I was. I will say that I was really happy after it. I felt that I could win this game with correct play. Mm. And playing correctly is, of course, one of the major problems in chess. Well, we won't uh, ask you to show this long game after such a yeah. tiring one. Uh, but it was very uh, instructive talking to you about this. If someone wants to improve his strategic understanding of such end games. Do you recommend some way to do that? Some. Uh, I think there are some really good classics in this structure. For example, uh, um, a really strong player from White was uh, uh, Emmanuel Lasker. Emmanuel Lasker played great games with uh, White side, and of course Bobby Fischer, but he generally didn't get end game. Mm. And uh, William Sinnott played really well with Black side, and he defeated Lasker twice uh, in such pawn structure. And both the times he got f5 break. So, that's one of the major ideas where the bishop becomes stronger after f5. And uh, white trying to stop f5 with knight on d4. White should have some squares for the knight. As the things happened, because c3 was played, white didn't have any squares. And also, white couldn't get to d5. So, the knights don't have squares 
and the bishop has only two squares so that became a major problem in the game i think uh, the classics are more uh, logical in this i would even say that uh, the stinitz lasker games in this are better than uh, games of today's masters quality wise right i think so we know that you are a big lover of classics so thank you so much for this yeah. suggestion before we let you go one thing we have to ask you is about our little wonder pragnananda who became a gm 3 days ago what do you think you must have seen few of his games uh, what's your opinion about him uh, yeah i actually i don't think i have seen him but i have seen his games and i was very impressed by some of his games particularly the white side of e4 um he because i play uh, black side where i have some problems uh, facing black against e4 and i found that uh, he had uh, some very uh, difficult uh, uh, some moves which are very difficult to meet i was myself preparing how to Uh, play if somebody plays like Pragan and I still not come with answer, so that uh, makes it very clear. This is very very dangerous player, and in fact I was expecting him to uh, become the first, uh, the youngest uh, grandmaster. I mean, in the last seven or eight months, I was a little surprised that he was not consistent after crossing 2500. But I think here we are looking uh, forward to somebody who will reach at the world championship level because uh, if you look at the existing top players. but they are very strong and there will probably be many who will be around 2700 but none of them will really one can say that could become a uh, world champion but i think here if nurtured properly and if he takes proper training different from different strong players at different times i think uh, he stands very good chance because his style is very similar to carlson i found that uh, he plays unforced variations and wait for you to make a slight tactical mm. inaccuracy and then you'd never come to know um, what has gone wrong till you analyze the game so that sort of uh, style i think is fantastic and uh, those who i think started uh, chess by uh, studying with engines have that uh, faculty automatically developed and it becomes very difficult to uh, guess their moves and uh, i think a very impressive player and even nihal said and i am looking forward uh, to his becoming a top player as well because the uh, calculate the tactical accuracy they have i think it's almost uh, in some of the games they are as uh, tactically strong as karuana or kalsan in some particular games and that sort of uh, ability if you have then all you need is good strategic study and uh, consistency in every game so with that i think uh, a very bright future particularly for pragnan and i look forward you, you to must have seen anand when he was young and he was upcoming so uh you might can you draw some parallels or they are completely different uh, well anand was more or less the original player who was strategically very perfect and uh, uh, he, he didn't have a style like morphy or uh, i mean he didn't play tactically he just played simple with pawn structures he never made weaknesses on his own and uh, he had i think something uh, uh, well he was much uh, less experienced when he was 13 i would say that uh, when he was 13 or 14 he had just played 3 4 tournaments so from that point of view i think anand had a different uh, uh, sort of uh, way of uh, looking at chess he was just uh, playing what occurred to him as a good move i mean there's not so much of logical reasoning because uh, he knew what was right so very often it just he just uh, you, he didn't have to think of a plan and that i have not seen any other player who doesn't have to think of a plan and then just uh, finds the plan automatically very strong yeah uh, i'll say intuition or uh, what you can call is a chess talent basically a gift uh, regarding chess because uh, he may not be more intelligent than kasparov or karpov but the gift like uh, if you give them puzzles say one minute or two minutes who is better now anand will probably in 3 or 4 seconds anand will say white is better or black is better that ability even carlson or karekin or kasparov they do not have but uh, okay they uh, these players have defeated him so they have something else which anand doesn't have but with regard to judgment i think anand just set a position and anand just just explains you who is better why somebody played what's the play, plan for white what's the plan for black and that sort of so that i think i have to yet to see uh, pragnanand and nihal sen or any other players uh, at uh, so closely that i can know about their thinking process but sure. uh, anand's thinking process i saw it was just fantastic he knew what to do and for him it was very simple what to do how to bring about the position <laughs> which he was aiming at and very often we struggle in finding out what was he doing so very often when he got a desired position we were still happy and then we realized that 
all along he had been planning this and now it's hopeless for us. No? Most of the Indian players had that sort of uh, fate against him that uh, they were unable to understand him most of their lives <laughs> till he till the entire world knew about him. So I think that sort of talent is I think a phenomenon I would say. But uh, I don't think uh, merit wise Praganand or uh, Nihal or perhaps some other players also less because I don't think they are less because they are strong. Maybe they are more experienced, but it doesn't take away any of their credits. I think uh, they have studied because it, it's a time to study, the material is available. Sure. And uh, I think great future for uh, India with regard to World Championship, uh, if, they, if they continuously improve for four or five years, I think they would already, already be very close. Thank you so much for spending time with us and uh, it's always a pleasure to see you in action. Uh, good luck for the remaining rounds. Thanks a lot and I must have my special thanks to Chessbase India because uh, not necessarily for me because I don't have much time to study but uh, the material which you make available to the youngsters I think it's uh, phenomenal, it's fantastic at a very cheap rate and uh, I wish uh, at our time so much material was available it would have made a lot of difference to me and even other players of my generation who most of the time they struggled in finding out whether a position was good or bad. But, you know, you provide uh, ready material that this position is already good or bad and they just have to aim for that. I think the um, electronic uh, revolution has really done good, but uh, uh, keep on your good work doing. I think you are doing a lot for Indian. Thank you so much. It means a lot.